It's been a roller coaster year for most of us. We're stressed and struggling and perhaps a bit scared. It's brought out the best in so many people, but arguably the worst in others. Minorities and communities of color were the hardest hit by the pandemic and then hit hard again as a COVID stricken prison system released a flood of primarily minority job seekers into the worst unemployment environment in decades. Then the final straw, George Floyd dies while being restrained in police custody. The resulting anguished response ricocheted from coast to coast in demonstration after demonstration, calling for the end of racism, particularly in our law enforcement and criminal justice systems. Welcome to Take Notice. I'm your host, Dan Lawson. Our guest today is a member of one branch of the criminal justice system. We welcome for the first time, Assistant District Attorney James Wade, a member of the San Mateo County District Attorney's Office for almost 32 years. During that time, he was assigned to many specialty units within the agency and is presently overseeing the Municipal Court Division and the Juvenile Division. Over the years, Attorney Wade has had an opportunity to see the DA's office in our county change and has an evolving perspective about law enforcement and the county. Thank you so very much for joining us, Assistant District Attorney Wade. Thank you for having me. Well, let's start with the basics. What are the priorities and mission of the San Mateo County District Attorney's Office? Well, the mission of the District Attorney's Office in San Mateo County is to prosecute juvenile and adult offenders in a professional and ethical manner. Now, my office uh, has approximately 140 employees, including our attorneys, our support staff, our inspectors, and our victim advocates. And one of the divisions of our office that's grown the most is our Victim Advocate Center, because we believe that victims are a priority in the county. These are individuals that came to the criminal justice system by no fault of their own. They are scared. They are mad. Some of them have been economically deprived and physically hurt by acts that were not of their own doing. So my office wants to make sure that those victims have a voice, that they have somebody that's advocating for them. And that's what the 140 or so employees of the district attorney's office do. That's what we stand for. That's what we try every day and strive to get better and better at. So there's heightened public concern that law enforcement personnel aren't held to the same standards and penalties if they commit the same type of crime as members of the public. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I understand that feeling, especially in what's been going on over the last couple of weeks and months and actually years and even decades, because we can go back to 1991 in the Rodney King case in Los Angeles, where you saw what you believe were police officers committing a very heinous crime. And even though they were prosecuted, the prosecution wasn't successful. And it led to this upheaval and political unrest. Well, we're seeing that today. And again, it's because of an issue where a police officer did something that was illegal. And it will be determined whether he will be convicted of doing something that for the most of the community believes is something that is definitely e easy to determine that a person was guilty. We have to, as a prosecutor's, prosecutor's office, look at it from a different standpoint. We have to look at 
what the conduct was, was that conduct criminal, and how can we prove that a person is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? That is a very high standard in any case. And that's the standard that we are tasked with in any criminal prosecution. That being both against a law enforcement officer or against a citizen of the community. So what we look at and what we do at the San Mateo County District Attorney's Office is we look at every case on an individual basis. We don't look at whether an individual is in law enforcement or not. We like to believe that because of our ethical duties, we will do what is right, what is fair in every situation. Now, that a lot of people would look at that and go, well, I see all of these things that are transpiring in other jurisdictions. And I can just say in my county that we have a process that we go through to make sure that individuals are treated fairly, they're pre treated ethically, and that there isn't a bias in the way we prosecute. With officer-involved incidents, we have investigators or inspectors that go out and they do their own investigations on serious criminal matters. That and our investigators or inspectors are independent of any police department. They are part of our office and they investigate and they write reports for the district attorney himself. Now, once they complete their investigation, these cases are looked at by senior prosecutors in the office. And these senior prosecutors get together, they talk about the crime itself, they talk about the evidence that's been presented, and they make recommendations based upon their years and decades of experience. Once that recommendation is made to Mr. Wagstaff, he then ultimately makes determinations as to whether someone should be prosecuted or not. But this is a process that we go through on every officer-involved critical situation because we believe that this is what you have to do in order to make sure that the correct outcome will occur. It doesn't mean that we file every case against a police officer but we make sure that if we do not file a case, it's because ethically we cannot prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that always is our standard when we are talking about proving a case. Okay. And as you mentioned, you're bound by the penal code to determine whether the elements of the crime are there uh, to, that, to be able to prosecute. And, and often that, that's lost in, in the emotion and the passion sometimes. Yeah. That is correct, because some people see an event and they have that immediate reaction, oh my God, that is criminal. They might not know what criminal act is occurring, but they know it's criminal. It's up to my office to make the determination as to what criminal act occurred and what we can ethically charge. Now, once we make that determination, our prosecutors are, they go full forward. They make sure that they do what is ethical and what is appropriate to try to get the resolution that uh, is necessitated by the evidence and by the facts. You, you mentioned a little bit earlier about how, um, uh, how, the justice may not be equitable, and this has been going on for not just decades, but centuries probably. But So what are your thoughts about the overhaul of the criminal justice system, considering the apparent lack of equitable justice offered those in particular in the lower socioeconomic group as well as people of color? Well, I've been a prosecutor, as you stated, for 32 years. So I've gotten to see a, a change in the way in which criminal prosecutions and actual uh, criminal penalties have evolved. Now, when I started in the office in uh, 1988, uh, it was more about punishment. 
uh, the law looked at certain crimes and they set a lot of mandatory minimum punishments for different types of crimes. Like everyone's heard the phrase, uh, use a gun, go to prison. That was one of the tenets when I first started. Uh, the three strikes legislation, three strikes. that came into being when I was a young prosecutor. And the reason why those things came into being is because the community wanted us to be tough on crime. Mm -hmm. Community saw a lot of really horrendous criminal acts and they wanted to make sure that individuals who may have had a prior history of doing violent crimes, that this all was going to be taken into consideration in the sentencing phase of a case. As the years have gone by, and we, we've seen where the community wants, of course, criminal conduct punished, but they also now want to look at the underlying factors in the criminal system and the criminal's mind. Because if there are reasons for the criminal conduct, the community wants that taken into consideration. So the way the laws have been evolving over the last 20 years or so is there have been more specialty courts, especially like in San Mateo County, where we can take into consideration certain factors that might mitigate a person's criminal conduct. Like we have had a drug court. If we find out an individual is committing crimes because of an underlying drug problem. That's something that we also look at when we're trying to make determination as what the appropriate sentence is. We have a veterans court for individuals who've been in the war, who've come back, who've had issues adjusting because of their service. We take that into consideration in drug court in trying to fashion an appropriate punishment or rehabilitative uh, service for the individual who's committed these crimes. There are a lot of different factors we can take into consideration now to try to come up with an appropriate sentence. And we've really seen it in the juvenile court because the juvenile court where it used to be about punishment and rehabilitation, now it's flipped. It's more rehabilitation versus punishment because there have been a lot of studies that have been done about adolescent brain and their formation. And because of that, we take these things into consideration uh, to try to make sure that we can address issues of minors before they become adults. So the criminal law has evolved in a lot of ways in which to help individuals of socioeconomic deprivation in addressing some of that poverty, some of the reasons behind why these crimes are being committed. So we do take that into consideration more now than we have in the past. And, and to your point, um, arguably the war on drugs, um, looking back, was treated as a criminal, uh, criminal issue and really should have been treated as a, as a health issue. Um, uh, and people of color, lower socioeconomic group were more, more targeted. Uh, the same basic offense that whites often uh, are, uh, committed were not prosecuted equi equitably. Well, there are some studies that say that. Um, I like to believe that prosecutors are going to always treat everybody the same. That might be me being a little naive, but in my office, that's what we strive for every day, to try to treat everyone the same. Uh, that being said, we also understand that uh, you know, when 
the war on drugs started, it got out of hand really quickly. It ballooned and uh, it overtook a lot of the criminal activity that was occurring. Uh, so uh, we had to figure a way to address it. And initially, the way that the criminal justice system addressed that was by punishment. We figured if we locked up individuals that uh, were involved in the drug trade, that were um, themselves uh, partaking uh, and using drugs, if we lock them up, we could curtail the entire drug system. Well, that really didn't work. So the legislature, as well as the community, let it be known that we don't want you locking up individuals who have a drug problem. We don't want to see individuals with a drug problem in state prison, going to state prison for that. So that's how the law has evolved. And that's why um, right now the law has changed with regards to individuals that have possessed most illegal substances. They're no longer felonies. The most they can be charged as is misdemeanors because the community itself spoke up and said, we don't think it's right for users to be treated like a violent offender and being sent to uh, prison over having a drug problem. And, and the public is calling for an independent review and revision of the Universal Code of Ethics for law enforcement, which directly addresses such issues as use of force, shootings, neck and throat chokeholds, use of tasers, explosives, tear gas, uh, and the use of police dogs. Will the district attorney's office play a role to support the revision? Well, we of course will look at whatever revisions are instituted or recommended because our office abides by what the law is. But we also look at what the community says. If the community uh, through its correspondence with my office or through working with the legislature to change the way uh, the laws are being interpreted, we will abide by whatever that is. With regards to assisting, we will assist in drafting policies if that's what is asked of us. But usually what we do is we wait until the legislature has determined what in fact the law should be and how we should be looking at it. And then we follow whatever that law is. And how about body cameras? Um, what are your thoughts on that, the DA's office thoughts on, on body cameras? Well, we're all for body cams. We. Uh, in San Mateo County have many of our law enforcement agencies use body cams. And they are a tremendous help because it shows when officers are doing things right, the body cam proves it. Mm -hmm. So for the officers that do everything right, the body cam is a godsend. But it also is one of those things that assist us to make sure that people are doing, the officers are doing things right. Because we always want to make sure that whatever we're going to put before a jury or before a judge is the, what we believe is the truth, how something happens. And body cam video will assist in that truth. But now, this is a training-related issue, but do you um, have any of your staff, um, attorneys, teaching at academies, uh, in particular San Mateo County Academy at, uh, at San Mateo uh, JC? Yes. Yeah. Actually, not only do our attorneys teach 
police officers at the Post Academy or even the Citizens Academy. Uh, we have our inspectors who teach and train other police officers in how to do investigations, how to do uh, handle officer-involved shootings. Uh, our uh, environmental and consumer fraud department, they go out, they teach. Even our victim advocates go out and they teach themselves. Uh, they teach themselves because what we're, uh, what we want to do is we want to be out in the community. We want the community to see us. We want the community to know that their voices are going to be heard by everyone. So we believe by us going out into the community, we can help teach everyone what the law's about, how the law's gonna be interpreted, and what they can do to assist us in criminal prosecutions. So one of the things that my attorneys do is they go out to the Post Academy, they teach criminal law to the uh, young officers, uh, or soon-to-be officers. Um, they also teach them how to uh, testify in courtroom presentations. They teach them how to write reports, because there, there are things that officers don't know innately. They have to be trained to be able to present a case to the district attorney's office so that we know whether an actual crime did occur and what the gravity of that crime is. So these are the things that my office, my deputies uh, go out and this is what they do uh, when they go and teach. But as I said, our inspectors go out, they teach law enforcement how to do investigations. How to Good, to hear. Also. Yeah. Good to and hear. And our victim advocates do the same thing with regards to how to talk to victims, how to interact with them how to make them feel comfortable so that they can then get the information they need to, so that the district attorney's office has that information to prosecute a case. Great, thank you. Now I know many organizations, institutions have been making statements with regard to the condemning of racism and bigotry. Uh, has the district attorney's office issued any public statements with regard to that? Actually, yes. Um, Mr. Wagstaff on June 1st of 2020 issued a statement with regards to that. And it was a very moving and powerful statement. And uh, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to read it because it, it, it's impactful, but it also shows what my office is about. Uh, this is the statement that he wrote on January 1st. As district attorney of San Mateo, I joined the other dis district attorneys in California in condemning the senseless death of George, George Floyd in Minneapolis. I extend condolences to the family of George Floyd and to the communities across the nation that are in mourning over Mr. Floyd's death. As a society, we must bring an end to bigotry and racism in our country. And it is the solemn responsibility of all government leaders and every member of the criminal justice system to achieve this goal. The citizens of this country cannot rest until we bring an end to racial inequality and racism in our country. After 43 years as a prosecutor in San Mateo County, it saddens me that shocking events such as Mr. Floyd's death and the violence that followed continue to occur. We will continue to collaborate with the San Mateo County law enforcement agencies to train their officers in an effort to ensure proper and lawful conduct by officers and to appropriately investigate any conduct that violates the law. Every member of the San Mateo County District Attorney's Office will resolutely continue to seek justice and fairness in, an, in our criminal justice system. To this end, I have signed the attached statement of the California District Attorney's Association issued this past weekend condemning racism and bigotry. I hope and pray the principles enunciated in this statement may soon be achieved. And it's signed Steve Wagstaff. That is what our office is about. That's what we feel. 
And we really try hard to make sure that this type of situation would never happen in San Mateo County. Thank you. Is there a user-friendly website where members of the public can go to learn more about the criminal justice system in San Mateo County? Yes, uh, our San Mateo County uh, District Attorney's Office has a website and you can uh, access that website by um, going, it's da.smcgov.org. That's a website where you can go to and it has information about the San Mateo County District Attorney's Office, things that we're doing, events that we're holding with our Victim Center, uh, with some of our training, uh, and it will give you a great overview of what's going on in the district attorney's office in San Mateo County. It takes courage to wrestle with the big entrenched problems. But more than that, we must have the ability to listen, to both listen carefully and sincerely try to understand. Those entrusted with administrating justice as well as the lawmakers, must take the long view. What kind of county, what kind of state, what kind of country do we want to live in? There's no going back to the days of our grandparents, only going forward. Let's picture the world we want and work for it. Thank you so much, Assistant District Attorney Wade, for the part you do play and will continue to play in making that picture a reality. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you viewers. Please like, share, and follow Take Notice. I'm your host, Dan Lawson, and please stay safe.